Hi, so today what we're going to talk about is infinite limits and then vertical asymptotes. So all you need to know for what an infinite limit is, is that's just a limit where a function is either increasing or decreasing without bound as x approaches c. So that just means your function is blowing up to positive infinity or down to negative infinity, basically making a straight line when, as you're approaching a c value. A more formal definition is now on your screen for you, and all it says is, is if f of x is a function that's defined at every real number in some open interval where your c value is contained inside of the interval, except that the function doesn't have to be defined um, where x is equaling c. The statement that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity means that for every m greater than 0, where m is just going to be some really big positive number, there's going to exist a delta so greater than 0, so that's bringing us back to that epsilon delta definition of a limit we've talked about previously, um, such that f of x is going to be greater than m whenever the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. So that just says that whenever you're, you're within that delta neighborhood around your c value, around your x value, your function value, your y value, is going to be bigger than that large positive number m. So that just means as you get closer and closer, you're going to get bigger and bigger, and you're going to be exceeding that set value for m. So just like all other limits, infinite limits also have properties. So to talk about these, we're going to let the limit as x approaches c of f of x be equal to infinity. So we're going to let that one be our infinite limit. And we're going to let the limit as x approaches c for another function g of x be equal to some number, and we're just going to label that as l. So the first property, just like before, we're going to talk about the addition and subtraction of functions. So if we take the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x, that's just going to be equal to infinity. That makes sense. If you take infinity and add a number, you're still going to get infinity. If you take infinity and subtract a number away, you're still going to be at infinity. So the second property deals with multiplication. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x. And now this can have two different answers depending on l. So the first answer is that it's going to be positive infinity. And that's the case when L is greater than 0 or when L itself is a positive number. Or it can be negative infinity, and that's the case when L is less than 0 or it's a negative number to begin with. So then we have one more property to talk about. And that's of course, deals with division, the only operation we haven't talked about yet. So if we have the limit as x approaches c of g of x over f of x, that limit is going to be equal to 0. And if you think about it, if you take, say, we picked 4 to be L, you divided 4 by a really, really large number, your answer is going to be really, really close to 0. And the larger you would make the number in the denominator of your fraction, the closer and closer it would get to 0 until eventually you would just have to round it to 0. So the, the third property is just saying, you take a number, divide it by infinity, that's going to be the same thing as 0. So now we're going to talk about how to actually determine an infinite limit. So we're going to do this first from a graph. So the function that we're going to look at here is f of x is equal to negative 1 over x minus 1. So that's the graph that you're seeing on your screen. And so if we're looking at a few different things, say we're going to look first at the limit of x approaching 1. And we're going to do this first from the left bringing in those one-sided limits that we've talked about in the past video. So going from the left, and we're on a graph, so 1 is right here where the green dot is, so we're going to go a little bit to the left, say around 0, and we're going to go up to our function, and then we're going to trace it up towards 1. But as I do that, I never actually reach 1. I'm just going further and further up. I'm making a straight vertical line. So we could say here that that's going to be an infinite limit. So the limit as we approach 1 from the left is going to be positive infinity. Now, let's do the same thing, but from the opposite direction. Let's take the limit as x approaches 1 from the right side and see what happens. So same thing as before. We're going to go to a little bit of the right of 1, so maybe around 2. We're going to go down to our function, and then we're going to trace it 
down towards one, but we never actually quite get to one. We go down and down and down, basically making a straight line. So for that one, we're going to say that our limit is negative infinity. So on a graph, it's really easy to pick out infinite limits because you're going to see your graph either go basically straight down or straight up. So either up towards positive infinity or down towards negative infinity. So now, if we wanted to talk about the overall limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, we would say that that is DNE, or does not exist. And that's because it's not only is both of them going to infinity, they're going in opposite directions. So we can't even just say, hey, the limit doesn't really exist, but it's really going up to positive infinity and just write the infinity sign, because from one direction you're going to positive infinity, and from the other direction you're headed down towards negative infinity. Okay, so now that we've gone over how to do it from a picture, we're going to talk about what, how do you figure them out when you aren't given a graph and you have no idea what this function looks like? So for this one, we're going to consider the function 2 over x minus 3. So the first limit we're going to look at is the limit as x approaches 3 from the right. So determining infinite limits numerically really just means to think about it. So if we're approaching 3 from the right, that means we're using numbers that are just a little bit larger than 3. So like 3.1, 3.001, stuff like that. So if we plugged those numbers in for x there in the bottom, we would get a small positive number in the bottom of our fraction. So we would have 2 over a small positive number. So 2 is a positive number, so 2 divided by a positive number is going to give us a positive answer. And then 2 divided by a small net positive number is going to give us a really big answer. And if you're not quite sure of why, try some numbers out on your calculator. Divide 2 by 0 0.01 and then 2 by 0 0.001 and make the number in the denominator smaller and smaller and see what happens to your answers. And if you do that, you're going to see that you get, keep getting larger and larger answers as you get your denominator to be smaller and smaller. So we're going to say that the limit here is actually positive infinity. So now that we've looked at the limit as x approaches 3 from the right, we should, of course, look at it from the left. So now we're going to think about numbers that are slightly to the left or slightly smaller than 3. So those are values like 2.9, 2.99, and so on. So now if we plug numbers that are smaller than 3 into the denominator of our fraction, we're actually going to get a negative answer in the bottom. So the 2 stays constant on top, so 2 divided by a negative number is going to give us a negative answer. So we can just already put our negative sign up there. And then we're going to have 2 divided by a really small negative number. That's going to give us a really large positive, um, not positive, a negative number. So here from the left, we are actually approaching negative infinity. So again, because they're not both going to the same direction of infinity from both sides, we're going to write the total limit as x approaches 3 of the function. That's going to be dNe again. Okay, so now that we've kind of covered what an infinite limit is, we're going to start talking about what a vertical asymptote is, and these, these two concepts tie together. So the definition is on your screen for you, and all a vertical asymptote is, is it's those vertical lines that you sometimes see on graph where the function gets really, really close to that line, but never actually touches it or crosses it. So you can see one of those in the graphing example that we did not too long ago. You can see that there's kind of a line here where the graph gets really, really close on both sides, but never actually touches it and doesn't cross it either. So this would be a function that has a vertical asymptote. So looking back at our definition, you're going to have a vertical asymptote if you have an infinite limit. So the line x equaling c is a vertical asymptote of the graph when you have either the left or the right limit or both limits approaching positive or negative infinity as you get closer and closer. So you might be thinking, I take a limit every time I want to know about where my vertical asymptotes are. And you can, that's a great way to think about it. But you can kind of think about it in a different way. Vertical asymptotes are going to happen. So vertical asymptotes happen. And I abbreviate asymptotes as ASY. So vertical asymptotes happen when the denominator is equal to 0.
So you want to look to see where the denominator of your function is going to equal zero. And not only that, you want to see if the numerator is not equal to zero. So the denominator should equal zero, and you can't cancel with anything, and no canceling. So that means there's no common factors between the denominator and the numerator. That means that you could cancel out the factor that's giving you a zero in the bottom. So now what we're going to do is we're not just going to talk about the theory of vertical asymptotes anymore. We're actually going to do some examples and show you how to find them. So for the first example, we're going to look at the function f of x equaling 1 over 2 times x plus 1. So now, since I have a 1 in my numerator, I don't really have to worry about if the numerator is going to ever equal 0 because it's always going to equal 1. Don't have to worry about it. So in order to find if I have vertical asymptotes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my denominator equal to 0. And so now I'm just going to solve like any other equation. So we divide both sides by 2, cross them out over there. We get x plus 1 equals 0, subtract 1 over, and then I get x is equal to negative 1. So because our top, the top of our function is always constant, it's always positive 1, we don't have to go back and check here. So we can go ahead and say that we have a vertical asymptote at x equaling negative 1. And it's always important to write the x equaling part because for an asymptote, you are writing the equation of a line. So if you just said vertical asymptote at negative 1, well, do you mean negative 1 on the x-axis, negative 1 on the y-axis, at a point on the function that has negative 1 as the x or the y-coordinate? You're not being uh, really specific there, so you don't want to be vague. You want to say the vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. So now let's look at a slightly more complicated function. So for this one, we're going to look at f of x equaling x squared plus 2x minus 8, all divided by x squared minus 4. So whenever you see a rational function like this, what you might want to do first is look to see if you can factor either the numerator or the denominator, because factoring can sometimes show you a lot more information than you can see initially. So the top is factorable, and what it factors down to is x plus 4 and x minus 2. And then hopefully you can see immediately that the denominator is also going to factor out because it's that difference of perfect squares that factors real nicely, so that's going to factor into x plus 2 and x minus 2. So our denominator is going to be equal to 0 when x plus 2 equals 0 and x minus 2 is equal to 0. So solving for those, we get x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. But now are both of those vertical asymptotes? And hopefully what you can see is that they're not going to be. And the reason why is because this x minus 2 is a common factor. We can actually cross that out. So because it's a common factor, this x equaling 2 is not going to be a vertical asymptote. It's actually going to be a whole, if you remember back to when we talked about discontinuities, that would be a removable discontinuity or a whole, and since we can't remove that x plus 2 factor from the bottom, that's going to be a non-removable discontinuity or a vertical asymptote. So for this function, we would say there's a vertical asymptote at x equaling negative 2. So that's a really quick and brief overview of what an infinite limit is and then how they tie into what a vertical asymptote is and then how to find where vertical asymptotes happen. So I hope this video was really helpful for you and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching.